biotechnology breakout session. We have uh, two speakers today, and let me introduce them and, and sit down. Uh, our first speaker will be uh, Bud Nelson. He's a uh, chief of intellectual property council at uh, Primary. Uh, uh, Bud's background is a bachelor's in biology and uh, biomedical technology, master's PhD in Fort Law School, and uh, practice law up in uh, Buffalo, New York. I understand that in Buffalo. Um, those who don't know, Time Merit is a company that uh, was formed at Duke University Technology Center. Uh, it's also an honor to be here because of that. Um, what happened to the mm -hmm. um, A lot of those that like context, uh, this could either be my disclaimer or be my, my work that I intend to be informative. So you pick your choice there. Um, okay. The, uh, I want to uh, discuss three cases. You. Uh, this got three has impacted uh, the bio community in a significant way. Both all together, universities, small companies, and, and big pharmaceutical companies. Uh, and the first case uh, was just handed down uh, several weeks ago from the Federal Circuit is the University of Rochester, which is uh, Sterile and Co. And uh, um, the, the case um, involves, uh, let me go back one, I think. Um, parties here are um, University of Rochester and uh, Cyril, which uh, was purchased by Monsanto, and you can go down the chain and find up and end up calling the other party uh, Pfizer. But I want to get a show of hands. How many have heard of Celebrex, the drug? I mean, if you, don't, you can only not hear it if you don't watch TV or you have pop lock or something because it's over, it's marketed very well. Um, and as a matter of fact, it's marketed so well that uh, the annual sales uh, are about $3 billion a year. In terms of pharmaceuticals, that's the blockbuster drug with capital letters. And so you can see there's a lot, to, a lot at stake in this particular case. Okay, so let's see what the technology is. The technology, cyclogenases are, uh, are um, proteins that were involved in prostaglandin and synthesis, and U of R discovered that there's actually two of these cyclooxygenases, COX1 and COX2 for short. And uh, your non uh, steroid, uh, anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin, ibuprofen, etc., cetera, in inhibit both COX-1 and COX-2. Well, inhibiting COX-1 is where you get the side effects from these drugs. Um, you get the GIP and others, uh, et cetera. Um, if you can selectively inhibit COX-1, uh, then what you really do is just you're inhi inhibiting inflammation. And that's good, especially in inflammatory diseases. And so you have brought, uh, University of Rochester received a patent, and I call it the 850 patent. And uh, the claims were directed to really to method of treatment. And, um, you know, I, I'm at luxury having Judge Rader just uh, talk about the claims and how they relate to the specification. So I, I, I can't answer that better on this instance. Um, the claims are directed to a method of treatment using a um, COX-2 inhibitor, uh, as you can read. Um, so what the patent describes um, is a method for screening for a COX inhibitor and the method of using a COX inhibitor. But uh, in terms of describing what a COX inhibitor is, basically uh, in the lingo of a patent practitioner, it was boilerplate. It was like, hey, it could be a protein, it could be DNA, it could be RNA, it could be antibody. Um, but, but the actual 
description of what a COX-2 inhibitor is was not given in the patent specification. So the day that the, the patent issued, you have a supervisor alleging that the CLS inhibitors, Celebrex uh, in particular, uh, infringed their patent. And uh, Vice moves for summary judgment for invalidity. Uh, and particularly, they pointed out uh, uh, two requirements, uh, the written description requirement and an requirement. And if you recall from your classes and from your experience, uh, for to, to get a patent, the invention has to be novel, not obvious, uh, useful, and but there's also some additional requirements, and that is that, as Judge Rader described to you, the framework of your claim, um, it, the claim of the invention has to be described uh, adequately to, to give you an idea that the inventor actually possessed the invention at the time of filing the application. That's number one. And number two, which is the written description requirement. Number two is that uh, the, the disclosure has to be enabling it enable someone to make the claim invention. <coughs> so the uh, district court in Western District in New York, back up in Buffalo, you know, it's up there, but right, uh, um, opinions, because it's so darn cold up there. Uh, <laughs> I was up there in January to visit some friends, and for the two days I was there, it never got above zero. That's cold. <laughs> um, the, uh, the district court said, you know, the patent describes the test compounds and to determine if they do, in fact, inhibit uh, the COX-2 protein. Um, and it also describes you know, what you do, uh, you know, how, to, how to treat somebody. But what it doesn't do uh, is set forth uh, what the compound is, uh, identify what class of compounds. Uh, so their, their, their message is the composition is the main link. You know, you have a method of discovering them, a screen to find one, you have a method of using it. But, whoa, you know, there's, there's a gap here. And um, they, uh, they also said that, um, and, and you have to remember this is in the context that the method of treatment says that you're using the compound. The, the compound is an essential element of that claim. Uh, in enablement, um, the patent does not provide actually finding the compound that works, but really gives you a, a starting point and a, a research plan to find this compound, but it doesn't really tell you how, how to make And the Federal Circuit basically uh, agreed with the district court and said that you know, the 850 patent is invalid, and they didn't even go into enablement. They just focused on the written description requirement. And again, the written description requirement said that, uh, as the judge made pointed out to you, the specification and the claims really have to relate to each other. And uh, you know, the claim has an essential element, which is the compound, but the specification has this uh, whole in terms of description of the compound. So they just focus on written description. That says that um, you have to uh, the specification uh, the uh, all um, critical elements of the claim, all essential elements of the claim, uh, with enough uh, specificity that one skill in the art uh, would recognize that the inventor, claim, the inventor possessed the claim invented at the time of filing. So here we're looking, and, and the Federal um, says, look, you know, essential of the claim, the compound, and no compound that performs the claim method are disclosed, uh, or was there any evidence that the inventors knew of one, even if it was in the, in the prior or in the general public domain. And therefore, um, because the, the compounds are essential to the claim of the patent, uh, the, the patent, or, I'm sorry, the, the patent is invalid for, for failing to comply with the written description requirement. Really, the patent discloses nothing more than, like I said before, a research plan. A way to find uh, a, a drug of a that has a hope for function uh, and for trying to find it. So, how does this, how does this uh, decision affect us, uh, whether you're a university, a small company, or a big company? Um, you know, there's, there's, we, we see a decision, what we try to do is reconcile it and, and try to adjust our practice in some way to uh, avoid this kind of situation. You know, one thing is uh, don't file until you have some compounds, and, and you know, uh, that's hard to do because, you know, biotech is a pretty uh, competitive area, and you don't want to be beaten to the punch. But, you know, it's, it's prudent to try to get at least a couple compounds and file, and then, you know, if you're developing more, then go ahead and file a here, go ahead and file another division on it, you know, build up as you go along. Um, that's one way to go, but the same occurs if 
you are limited to uh, small molecules and, and you're limited to a particular chemical class, um, you know, likely uh, you can get the DNA of a protein, RNA, or antibodies. Um, another way to uh, add it, and I like the second alternative the best, um, both the district court and the federal court know that um, you can meet the written description requirement if you describe the functional characteristics. And, you know, Judge Rader uh, helped, helps in this uh, way in that can claim by function, um, provided though know, that function has some kind of correlation uh, or is coupled with a known or disclosed correlation between function and structure. Well, what, what's you know, Okay, I'll give you an example of, and this one's from technology. We have patents that disclose um, peptides that inhibit uh, the H virus from getting HIV from getting into cells to infect. And these peptides are, you know, strings of amino acids. And what we discovered is that we could use an algorithm. Using a certain key amino acids, we can develop an algorithm that um, does the following. It'll help us identify pretty much in most cases or in all cases. I don't know if it's our case or what it's true, but if the peptide is recognized by this algorithm, it A has a, a specific three dimensional structure, B, uh, it more often than not inhibits the uh, infection of the cell by the HIV virus. So we, we demonstrated in our specification by using a, a, a multi or an algorithm uh, and getting to a, a function, we can claim all peptides by just saying a peptide recognized by this algorithm and inhibits HIV. So there's a good example of what, um, you know, disclosing a relation between function and structure. And the other example is uh, there are a lot of companies now that are doing um, molecular modeling and they're using uh, uh, X-ray crystallography and and, and there is another uh, way to go about doing a structure based design based on uh, X-ray crystal or crystal structure. Um, and then a third alternative is, is uh, you I didn't want to do, and, and Jim probably touched more on this, they could have filed the green acid patent uh, first, and then they discovered compounds that they were not, they could have gone ahead and um, filed on compounds they discovered, but if they were in the drug discovery business, then they're, they're just limited to the screening assay patent. And uh, you don't get as much value for a screening assay patent as you do a license of compounds. Uh, that takes me to the next case, um, Bayer Housie Pharmaceuticals. Uh, section 271 of 35 USC is a section that uh, talks about infringement. And the section lays out what is an infringement and it also lays out what's not an infringement and lays out some, some exemptions from infringement. Here, um, th we're talking about 271G. And it uh, says, uh, paragraph says that um, uh, the infringement of the ability for importation into the U.S. of a product if you buy a process patent in the U.S. What's that mean? Well, look, if, if I develop a, a patent, a method of uh, making that, let's stick with the primary technology, for example. If if I patent a method of making one of these peptides, and say I develop a method where you know, it's too hard to make one shot, so I do method where you make segments of it and you can tie them together to get the final product. So I go ahead and, and patent that in the United States. And, uh, but I don't patent it in, uh, say, uh, uh, for example. And somebody in France makes it by that method and they try to import it in the United States. The statute says, well, wait a second. No, uh, you can't import that product made by this patent in the United States back in the United States without constituting infringement. That's what that section means. So here we have how they had a patent, and uh, basically it was uh, a method of screening for a, um, an inhibitor or an, an activator of a certain protein. Uh, this is more of the claim language, so I'm just going to summarize it for you. And Bayer went did in a foreign country, they used the the method to identify a pharmaceutical product and imported the pharmaceutical product into the U.S. Um, this is going to be a pretty interesting case because it may have some, uh, um, it may extend out beyond biotech, and I'll get into that in a second. But the CS um, circuit says the product of the housing is information. You know, you have a screening method to see if a protein, uh, if, if the compound inhibits, uh, protein activity or activates the protein. So, what your screening method tells you is uh, 
what the uh, conversation uh, does in terms of you know the information or no, and uh, how they say well, look one of their claims was that, well or one of the, one of the points in litigation is that um, look the uh, why can't information be a product? And uh, the circuit said to the legislative intent of uh, 271, and what the, what the interpretation is that 271B is limited to the importation of physical articles. Information is not a physical article. Um, manufactured abroad. Processes of identification and of data are not the manufacture of a final product. And I think I need to explain something here. In most cases in drug discovery, um, when you have a screening assay, what you usually find is not usually the final drug product. You'll find something with some activity, and then it's got to be logged to optimize it for uh, you know, maybe and, and uh, pharmacokinetics and toxicity and you can find. So very rarely do you find something with a screening assay that's the final drug product. This is what the, the point that the federal circuit is making is that, in fact, what you find is a candidate, and then you go from there to get to the final drug product. And then the final drug product is the one that was bare um, imported into the U.S. So there's there's a, a connect there or the or you know, such a, a tenuous connection that a, you know, a physical article manufactured uh, by this method. So the bottom line is that if you have a U.S. patent for a method for screening uh, or identifying a drug, um, there's a problem. There's a loophole. Now the um, way uh, the decision comes out is that. Um, you, uh, if, a, if a drug is discovered in another country where this particular uh, method for greening hasn't been patented, it could be imported, the drug could be imported into the U.S. without infringing the U.S. patent. And, and it brings me to a point, you know, one, one question is, well, why don't you just go ahead and patent it in every country? And when you think about a small company and the hundreds of countries that are patent laws for hundred anyways, uh, it's just not practical to, to go ahead and, and patent this screening uh, in every single country. And even big farmers do that, and even with all the money they have. I mean, they'll cover a lot of them, but they don't cover, usually they don't cover a single one. So this is a problem, and, and uh, it's a problem because it encourages screening activities offshore to um, avoid the U.S. reach tool patent. And uh, that's a problem because uh, there's a good sector, a good sector, the biotech sector, based on, on uh, drug screening. Um, so uh, that would that would have uh, just have a potential for a big effect here of uh, companies that rely on drug screening for revenue. And and the federal circuit uh, was quick to point to Congress and say, look, you know, the federal circuit recognizes this is a problem, but it's really one for Congress to fix. Not us. We interpreted the statute intended to be from the legislative history. So you know, in D.C. it's a problem, but you need. Ah, yes, the ripple that I was mentioning before. The, uh, how many people uh, are interested in law related uh, computers and computer software here? Does everybody here like biotech? Well, the thing is um, that this can go beyond drugs, but even to software. For example, uh, I mentioned that there's computer modeling going on now, and there's proprietary software that's been patented in the US uh, by many companies. For using this to identify chemicals, particularly drugs that have certain activity or bind at certain targets. And um, so, again, this is uh, what the software does is that information which says this is a potential drug or isn't a potential drug. And you can use a hypothetical that uh, offshore other people uses the software, identifies the chemical, manufactures the chemical, of course, and chemical into the US and infringing under this, under this uh, case. And it, it goes beyond that. Uh, there's some talk, and I have only briefly looked at this case. Make a big issue out of it. But I did want to cite it. Um, this is a case under another uh, uh, paragraph, section 271, which has to do with uh, more of exporting than printing is. But um, what, what the original decisions they compare the information as a product, where the fact circuit that the information is, is um, not. What the product is is actually the pharmaceutical product. So, um, there's a surprise if you see the 
any house case popping up uh, in, in the, the um, software arena. In this case, Microsoft got hit with, uh, I think it was $500 million damages. And I'm uh, saying about Microsoft because my PowerPoint presentation probably shut off on You know, there's a lot of stake here. Um, the third case I'd like to discuss is Tagra Life Sciences and, and is greater. He's not here. Okay. Um, it, interesting case. Uh, I picked this case months ago, and only when I sat down to speak did I, I uh, pretend to wrote the opinion, and sure enough, it was Judge Rader. Uh, and uh, I need to give you some background in this case uh, and talk about, briefly talk about Waxman Act. Catch Waxman Act. Act was to balance the interests of pharmaceutical companies get their 800 million or whatever the number of uh, dollars that they, they've invested to, to market, to get a drug to market and to market it. This is of generic drug companies who uh, you know, make the, once the patent goes off patent, will uh, make the drug and, and uh, it's a benefit to the public because, uh, of course, you know the generic drugs are a lot cheaper. So uh, it's this balance act. And one of the things that Hatch Waxman Act does in favor of the generic company, it says, look, you know, if you had to wait until the, patent, um, the drug came off the patent, and then you, then you started your activities of making the drug and putting it through the uh, bioequivalency testing that's required to submit your abbreviated drug application to the FDA, well, you're adding time actually to the favor of the patent holder because you ha now have all this time to before you can get the generic drug on the market. So what uh, Hatch Waxmax said, you as a generic company, uh, to, to be able to sell the drug, pay the patent expires, uh, we will allow you to uh, make the drug and, and perform the testing that's required for approval prior to the, the patent expiring so that um, that's not an infringing activity because you're limiting it to what's really needed for FDA approval and that only will need to come out day one down the line. And again, 271 um, of uh, 35 USC um, has an exemption in this case to what infringement is. And, and again, this is what I'm just saying that uh, this is called the safe harbor provision where if you are doing these activities, you as a generic drug company, if you're doing these activities um, for bioequivalency needed to submit to the FDA or any of any other um, federal law relates to those, then you're going to be okay if you, if you limit your activities um, to, this to these particular activities. And this is uh, pretty much a good uh, chunk of what 271 reads. And there's a lot of case law about what uh, and decisions about certain words in this, uh, in this statute, uh, particularly the words solely and for use related to. Uh, and actually, the cases were all over the board, so um, it's a good time for to come along and, and try to get more of a line rule of, of what this, what, what are do actually fall under the safe harbor provision as, uh, as uh, in a non-infringement. So we'll get into the case a little bit. And Tiger, they own five patents related to uh, short peptides, and uh, it's called the RGD peptide. And what happened was, uh, was uh, to some from, uh, Institute and uh, discovered this one research discovered that the RGD peptide could inhibit angiogenesis, angiogenesis is a process of a blood vessel formation. So, for example, the most uh, practical application is for tumors to grow, they, they induce uh, formation of blood vessels to come up to them and form around them, so they, they basically you know, get the nutrients from these blood vessels. If you have an anti angiogenic agent, the intent is to stop. Formation of the blood vessels so that tumors actually stop. Um, so this, this has some pretty good applications in medicine. Uh, and the agreement, and they offered a license and refused the license to the suit. And the issue that came to the fact was whether, under the safe harbor provision, uh, whether the safe harbor provision reaches back down the chain of exploitation all the way to uh, the research of uh, new drugs um, that will be subject to FDA review. Again, uh, um, it's always good to that uh, 
usually when you're doing a basic research, very rarely does the drug come directly from that research. What you do is you find a candidate, and that's analog for drug function to eventually get to the drug. And PFC, PAFC said, um, we're sponsored by work that was not clinical testing to supply information to the FDA, but basically just general biomedical research to identify new compounds and therefore it falls outside the safe harbor. And um, the, the, the quote that most people use from the CAFC and Judge Rader is that um, the hunt for drugs that may, may not undergo clinical testing for FDA approval um, that is not included under solely for uses reasonably related to FDA procedure. So, okay, now we, we got the uh, decision, and, and what does it mean? Um, uh, before I knew the Judge Rader's decision, I thought it was well written. And, and uh, not to say that it's <laughs> I didn't know how to patronize them. I think it's a very well written decision. And the reason is because it, it again focuses to the original intent of the Hatch Waxman Act. And that um, is the difference between what we allow uh, big farmer to do or small farmer to do and the generic drug manufacturer. So it, it puts a burden on the company to demonstrate a fairly direct connection between its research activities and the information that's required for a drug approval by the FDA. And at this point, it might be worthwhile to reflect back and, and I was at the pharmaceutical uh, conference uh, of um, actually some senators were there. And one guy said, you know, the way to get around this decision is, you know, whatever day you turn throw it at the FDA. And, uh, and in fact, somebody who is closest to this uh, is going to be Merck. Uh, said that Merck made the argument, hey, look, we submitted it to the FDA. And I, I don't think that's going to fool the federal circuit. Um, I really think the federal circuit, look, it's got to be information relevant to uh, the, approval, the FDA approval process. So it doesn't matter if you throw anything out it's through that. Um, and this decision is critical because, um, again, uh, and I think Ginny will get into a little bit more, but there's a lot of biotech companies that, that rely on the research tool patents to survive. Um, the problem is we still have the for research in dairy houses. You know, you, you help uh, the research tool patents survive by Integra the Merck, but there is that offshore loophole. Well, if it's not targeted in other countries, they can go out and use it in that country and the uh, product back into the US. <coughs> so um, after I discovered that uh, Judge Rader wrote the opinion, I went to the, when I was at the banquet last night. I asked Judge Rader about it. I talked to them and I said, you know, I really like this opinion because it really speaks to the legislative intent of the Hatch Waxman Act. And, and you know, Pharmaceutical company, generic drug uh, manufacturer. Um, I, I think Pat has set up this uh, um, structure which really addresses both parties' needs. It's needed some tweaking over the years, but it's, it's a very good thing. And, and I, I, was, I was happy to see, and, and I think a lot of practitioners here are happy to see this, where cases were going all over the board. Somebody finally pointing in the right direction, or at least pointing to a direction which we can live by. And Judge Rader looked at me and said, Where did you grow up in 1980? Through 84. He said, I was, in, I was directing the legislation for the Hatch Waxman Act. So, you know, this is why he, he was able to understand really what the intent of, of the legislation was. And as a judge, I mean, this must have been a great um, situation for him. He could actually um, convey that knowledge into the decision and put things back in perspective. And I was hoping Judge Rader was going to be here because I was going to give him a, a few minutes to uh, um, comment about the case, but I think he had to three, so um, I guess we don't have that opportunity. And I think that that's the last slide.
so, as Ken said, I am Virginia Bennett, I'm a patent attorney, Klein, and we're a research based Klein company, a research uh, here in North Carolina. A discussion of the 271E1 statutory research exemption. I'm going to talk about the other research exemption. Um, and this is the research exemption that up until a couple of years ago, most academic researchers covered whatever they were doing in the lab. They didn't have to worry about any kind of infringement. So in the U.S., there are actually two research exemptions. The statutory research I discussed earlier in the common law research exemptions. And this common law research exemption was out of some historic in the 1800s decided by Justice Story. And the first one was Whittemore v. Cutter, which was on machines that made the for moving out fibers of cotton and wool before they were spun into yarn, so it's the hot be back. And Cutter argued that he he was making the machines and never used them, so he did not infringe. Unfortunately, he was found guilty of infringement, but during that case, Justice Story talked about the intent behind the patent policy. It would never have been the intent of the legislature to punish a man who constructed a patented machine merely for philosophical experiments. And I'll come back to that word philosophical later. Uh, a later case, well, actually saw one involved the non patented materials uh, to make a patented machine. And the court found that that was not infringing. But again, the court pointed out the existence of this research ex exception and said the law of ability must involve the invention with an intent to use for profit, not for the mere purpose of philosophical experiments. So, there's a so the Whittemore and Sawa decision about theories of non patented invention just to see if it worked the way it was supposed to. And making that invention for philosophical experiments. But in fact, both of the decisions were based on the fact that the machine was based on this experimental use exception. For many years, the existence of the experimental use exception was used to justify not taking a license uh, in the research setting. And every day at Glaxo, our researchers, when they're setting out experimentation in new areas, they're faced with the issue of looking for patents that they might have to get licenses to in order to carry out that experimentation. So this common law. As of about 2000, a narrow common law or research ex existed in the state. Um, but recently, the federal circuit has removed the law in several situations, academic and business, and certainly has narrowed it to the point of extinction. And I just want to take a minute here. I'm going to be talking about research tool patents, and I want to make sure that I've defined my terms. Uh, a research tool patent, I mean a patent on an item or method that's not sold to the general public but is used primarily in a research setting. That doesn't mean the patent item can't be sold. Certainly there's a lot of specialized creation from chemical companies to the researchers. Um, but in general, it's something that's used only for research. <coughs> so one of the recent cases that discussed the research exemption was Embrex v. Service Engineering. And this is a case arising in North Carolina. This is a local company, exclusive licensee for some technology coming out of North Carolina State. And Technology around vaccinating poultry that are still in the eggs. They put a needle into the egg, they inject the vaccine into a specific anatomic part of the baby chicken, and the chicken is hatched, having some <coughs> immunity. And Imbrex made the machine, sold the machines, and with the machine, licensed for this patent method. So they came up with two service engineers attempting to design around these machines, and in their lab, they were designing the machines, and they were trying to inject the vaccine into a different part of the egg. Unfortunately, well, what during their research, they inevitably injected into the same area that was in the patented method. So inevitably, a percentage of their research infringed this patent. Uh, and the defendant also took sales orders for the machines, so there was a, a sales component. Um, the defendant was found to be infringing in district court, and half a million dollars worth of damages were awarded. But the Federal Circuit, when it was appealed to the Federal Circuit, the Federal Circuit clarified that the sale of those machines was not there were no direct damages because the sale of the machines itself didn't infringe the method. Uh, and the majority in Ambrex, this is 2000, and it was the panel, the majority recognized that a very narrow general experimental use exemption based on common law still survived. But they said the experimental exemption was not applicable because here the tests were expressly for commercial purpose, and that took it out of the exemption. So now we come to ADV2, which is also obviously a North Carolina case. And uh, Navy was the head of the Duke Electron Laser Lab. He left Duke apparently in rather amiable circumstances to use some of his patented lasers, and um, Navy sued. Duke argued several rounds of non infringement. The 
contract going on, but also the ceremonial use exemption. At the district court, the said there was a common law exemption solely for research, academic, or experimental purposes. And in fact, the MBREX research exemption for nonprofit uses. Many fields of the federal government have also vacated or remanded. They recognize that a very narrow common law external use exception remain, and Rader was not on this case. So, what did Kennedy v. Duke? They said, our president does not recognize any conduct in keeping with the alleged legitimate business purpose, regardless of commercial implications. And they noted that major universities such as Duke frequently uh, fund projects with no commercial implication whatsoever, but these projects still contribute to the business purpose of Duke, which is education and so forth. So they that regardless of whether there's a commercial gain going on, so long as the act is in first of the election center's legitimate business is not solely for amusement to satisfy all curiosity or philosophical inquiry, the act does not qualify for its exemption. And so since the legitimate business of every nonprofit research institution is research, and the legitimate business purpose of every educational institution is education, I find it really hard to imagine a situation where this common law experimental use exemption would take place. The only situation I can think of is perhaps a parent who homeschools their kid. They carried out a path that may be purely for the education of that child. That might uh, fit under the exemption. But when you think the decision really isn't a departure from previous there's only a handful of cases that the district court decision made found non infringement based on the exemption. A federal circuit has never found non, non infringement based on this exemption. But what this decision does do is it really blurs the distinctions between the academic researcher and the research for profit setting. You can no longer make this decision as if you ever could, based purely on a nonprofit, for profit vision. So at this point, the common law research exemption is seen as very, very narrow. Um, and then we come to Integra. And Bud talked about Integra in terms of the 271E1 statutory exemption. But what's interesting is that the majority and the dissent in Integra both also talk about the common law exemption. And this discussion, uh, the common law research exemption was not argued at all in Integra. But the dis discussion that goes on uh, is, is interesting because it illustrates kind of a policy debate that has to go on about the research exemption. In Integra, uh, the majority in the narrator held that applying the common law research exemption in this situation would, would vitiate the exclusive rights of these own technology research the patents. Basically, if you allowed infringe use research setting, you would make meaningless biotechnology patent rights. So, uh, Jeff Rader clearly believed that there is, if the common law research exemption exists at all, it's extremely, extremely narrow. And, and he also had stated expressly that there's no such thing as de minimis infringement. infringement, infringement. Um, and earlier, uh, oh, sorry, let me back up. Judge Rader also stated that because intent is irrelevant to infringement, you can't look at the intent of the infringer. I, I intend to use this only for experimental use, I intended to use it for commercial use. And he said, Sarah Jenkinson v. Fulton Davis for his uh, that intent for infringement and compares to it. And I have pointed out that uh, Jenkinson is about uh, the doctrine of equivalence, it's not at all about the research exemption. In contrast, in contrast to Judge Rader, Judge Newman, who wrote the dissent in Integra, appears to me that the policy underlying requires that there be some type of research exemption. And what's interesting is that Judge Newman worked as a researcher in American Cyanamid for 25 years before uh, her judicial career. Newman says that Integra, the basic research fell into research exemption, and then when she moved into clinical science, that fell into 271E1 exemption. So she would have excused all of it. And Judge Newman points out uh, uh, that the majority's prohibition of all research into patented subject matter is, quote, as practical as it is incorrect. She pointed out that the original description of research exemption referred to philosophical inquiry. And what's interesting is that at that time, the 1800s philosophy, the word, and coming back to Judge Ray's last time discussion, the word was used more like the word science today, so you could get a degree in natural philosophy from William and Mary or Oxford or Yale or whatever. And Thomas Jefferson referred to natural philosophy, including chemistry and botany. Even as late as 1913, the Western Dictionary defined natural philosophy as science. And interactions. So it's not the philosophy as we think of it, perhaps. And Judge Rader's um, 
six is he created an index that when not minimum difference to the damage computation process, and I'm quoting, it's full flexibility for court particularly large perhaps any awards for minimal infringement. And we actually talked about this at lunch. And I, I, I see that position is more reasonable than the entire agree with it. Um, I think that while the prospect of minimal damages certainly precludes it disincentive for the patent owner to sue with minimal infringement, I still think that it's not really an efficient or an accurate answer for the researchers who are setting up with the tremendous transaction costs and the uncertainty of potential litigation, to ask them to make the decision, well, I'm just going to do the little, so I will risk the, the damage computation is going to provide the flexibility to respond. And additionally, researchers are always vulnerable to injunctions in use. So Newman, uh, in her integrity, makes a distinction, as have others before her, between doing research on a patent item and doing research a patent item, and I just want to take a minute to talk about that. As an example, if someone had a on a cell-based system for producing protein, and I studied that cell-based system in order to improve its design around it, so I actually was doing research on it. Judge Newman's view that would not, should not be infringed, but my colleague down the hall was using that same system to produce proteins regularly for his own research. He was producing a lot of insulin, working on diabetes research, and that use would be infringed. He was using the patent invention for the purpose for which it was meant and not to improve or design around it. So Newman's point is that uh, the lack of research exemption, if the patent law system was strictly and perfectly to prevent researchers from advancing the patent until the patent expired, essentially and any improvement patent would be impossible to make a license from the, from the first patent holder. And of course, it's a question that arises over and over in biotechnology, and particularly in public policy, is if the person who gets the first patent on a protein or the first patent in the area be able to control or prevent subsequent research to improve that invention during the term of the patent. So which is correct. And I think Ray is absolutely right that there's no statutory basis for a de minimis or research exemption or a general research exemption. In fact, the Mady case is not so surprising given, given the precedent. But I do, I do question the reliance on minimal data just for diminished infringement. Um, and I think that if we look to other countries, other industrialized countries, some of them are in line with the industrial. And both Japan and Germany have a research exemption written into their patent law. And the Japanese exemption was uh, written in, in 1909, expressed to in technological advances. I have to say that I'm not a European patent attorney or expert in Japanese patent law, so I'm sure there's intricacies to how these are applied over there. I don't want to, I don't want to spoke. But in the U.S., the National Institutes of Health working group on research tools in their belief, these four provisions properly distinguish between research on a patented item and research using a patented item for the purpose for which it was meant. And the National Institutes of Health said that they believe in exemption for experimenting on a patent is, quote, Is there any legislative response to this? And certainly there have been attempts to establish research and other exemptions for invention. And in 1988, there was a congressional bill that tried to introduce a limited exemption for research. And what's interesting is the Judiciary Committee stated that a research exemption already existed in case law, and thus this provision is not needed. And I found at lunch day that Judge Ray was on the Judiciary Commission then. Um, I asked him whether that was him, and he said, well, it may have been, but he wasn't sure. Did suggest that Congress at some future point should have been Title 35 to provide for use of patented invention, provide that patent invention is not infringement if it's used for experimentation or research. In 1990, uh, the proposed uh, patent, patent competitiveness and technological including experimental supervision that would extend to, in, again, improve the design around the patent invention, and that was not enacted. In 1996, 35 U.S.C. 285 C1 the law, and that does provide that a medical practitioner can be sued for a patented medical procedure. Now, that's not in research, but it does show how it does show carve out areas non existing in the biology medical field. And finally, in 2002, uh, Representative Rivers introduced a bill to allow non commercial use of patented genetic sequences. She didn't get reelected, so this was kind of odd. But of course, 
potential legislative action uh, what's the situation today when patenting and researchers are at odds over a research based patent? And obviously, the ideal outcome would be for both parties to reach a agreeable license that is reasonable. So, from the patent perspective, clearly they want to cover the cost of developing the patented invention. They'd like to generate income to support their further work. Sharing the commercialization of that patent item, and ideally, many of them want to share profit from downstream products that are developed using that patented research tool, and that's what we to is reach through royalties. Um, and a defining term, reach through royalties, for my purposes, is on a downstream invention where that invention does itself infringe the patent, the licensed patent, and it's sometimes the sale of those downstream can, because of the delay in biotechnology and drug development, after the patent has expired. From a licensee's perspective, obviously, the reason is to obtain freedom to operate and freedom from uncertainty from the threat of litigation. With the payment of a reasonable royalty, and reasonable royalty is usually based on cost, i.e., what, what savings if I use this versus what would they do if I didn't have this research available? Um, or if they're actually selling the research tool, you know, reasonable royalty on cost. And again, the question is, what about royalties based on downstream products? And many like to want to avoid royalties on downstream products because the perception is that most cases, at the time of using the research tool, the risk is entirely on them. And Bud pointed out that in drug development, frequently when you you don't discover drugs, you discover active compounds. You then have to change chemically, um, optimize, it, not toxic, it's effective, the right TK, and so. Determining a reasonable royalty. And the discussion in TAG is actually very interesting. Uh, they were reading the case because they go over the factors, uh, mostly based on a 1977 District of New York case that went into negotiating a reasonable royalty. And the starting point is to imagine a hypothetical negotiation between the parties at the time of infringement began, that temporal aspect of the case, because usually at the time of infringement begins, the, the risks are greater, the uncertainty is actually going to get in the extreme product that will be. And so additionally, the court also integrated also noted that you have to look at the nature of the research tool, often non infringing alternatives that are costly with those be what terms of similar licenses, although the court noted that licenses are already are always a little suspect because the facts change so much. And finally, look at the world. How many licenses does a researcher take to do his research for one part of the world? It's economically impossible in, in research. So, and here's something interesting, but also the 271G recent decision in Hatsi that you could do research onshore and report the results of the research in, and that would be non infringing. So, the question is, comes up, does that provide that catalyst for a reasonable royalty determination? If I figure out how much will it cost me to move offshore or to contract it for be done offshore, should that be off the license? Because otherwise, I can just go ahead and do that. And uh, offshore use is not in the country either because there's no patent there, or because that country has broader research exemption written into their patent law. Any guidance but if you are studying, which of course will give you some guidance on what a reasonable role would be. City of Sanders, 1999, Southern District, California, the jury found $18 million in damages plus a 4% in the company. And this stamps for drug terror to the um, And what, what was particularly scary, particularly scary is that the amount was based on theoretical. There was no drug that actually been discovered. Um, the, the plaintiff's witnesses estimated the chance of successfully discovering the drug. The chance that that drug would be approved by the FDA and the chance that that drug would be successful in the marketplace and with a sum total of $1 million. Appealed the damage award speculative. The federal circuit found the patent never actually reached that decision. Maybe there was no damage award at the district court level, obviously, and it was not at the federal circuit, so we don't get that from Maybe. In Indrex, the district court awarded $500,000 in the federal circuit. The judges said there was no direct infringement. They never found anything that was actually something that was infringing. The only infringement was in their RD in the lab. 
that was minimal and did result in direct loss of the embryo. So that was the issue of damages. Was and Ken and I both worked at Excelsior, it was a local patent uh, law, now part of Allstate, and they represented embryo in the very beginning of, the, of this. And I distinctly remember sitting in the room conference room. The were covered by research exemption, and I was a second year associate, I thought, research exemption? No, what's that? Um, so, Tabra, so in any contract, half a million dollar damage award was struck down. In the jury awarded 15 million, and in Tabra, there, it differed from what you indicated. It actually was a drug that had been developed. It was a theoretical. Um, but reading the decision, it somewhat improperly by the fact that the drug had been developed because if you do that hypothetical negotiation at the time the engagement started, there was no guarantee that the successful drug would be developed uh, at one point the company that owned the patent technology along with all their other assets was sold for fifteen million. So they sold fifteen million of the patented technology was a little bit excessive. We're running out of uh, royalties. Um, I just wanted to discuss those. As discussed with regard to the Rochester and Fox 2 patent, the patent office is not too keen on grand patent claims for compounds that have not yet been discovered. So if you have a screening method and you're trying to get a claim and discovered by the screen, it's probably not going to be issued. Uh, but that doesn't prevent the owner of a screening patent from trying to get royalties. On compounds that are discovered by so the question is, if the product being sold doesn't infringe the license, infringe the license patent, and perhaps the patent has expired, is the patent misused to demand royalty for the product that was discovered using that method? The patent misuse is basically is an affirmative defense and it's an attempt to extend the economic benefit beyond the scope of the patent grant either by requiring royalties on non infringing items or by extending payment past the expiration of the patent. Pretty clear cut. When you look at the most recent case, or another aspect of the be housing, Bear argued that Posey had been guilty of patent misuse. Um, and they relied on a case in the radio that said that conditional license on royalties for non infringing product is patent misuse. Unfortunately, the court also said that where such royalties are for the convenience of the party, it's not misuse. For his licenses, one was an upfront lump sum payment, the highest and the other option was to pay royalties on drugs that were discovered using the method because the party had offered an option and was not guilty of patent misuse. There are reasons why certainly uh, a license would want to avoid a large upfront payment and pay royalties on a drug discovery because when they're starting out their research, they don't have much startup capital. Let's shift the cost down. Uh, Bear tried to argue was that because how the patent was expired and the royalties would continue, how it was misused in that way. And Bear, Bear relied on the Supreme Court Rule 64, Rouleau, which stated that patent was used when royalties accrue after the patent expired. And in Rouleau, um, they were selling a machine and you kept paying a royalty even after the patent expired for every year of the machine afterwards. And uh, the court in Derby Housing said that. Collecting royalties after the patent expires is not if those royalties are for what you did when the patent was so basically keeping the royalties for using the patented method and you did them downstream again. So they weren't so it's not a patent used to account for or to obtain through royalties. Were the licenses defined by the rules of patents? Were the licenses to avoid accruing royalties after the patent expires? Um, and were the royalties for the their mutual decision to agree to those. So, in conclusion, um, compound research exemption is correlated to 271E1 statutory research exemption, but in practical terms, it really is extinct. Uh, the federal, recent federal court decisions do provide us some guidance on what reasonable royalty calculations would be and what potential damages would be. Um, and it's also that despite the patent office's favor granting 
reach through claims, claims to reach through compounds, that royalties, reach through royalties are personal misuse. Now, personally, uh, I believe the underlying policy of patent law to promote innovation requires that there be some sort of research exemption for research on a patented item. Uh, it's similar to that set up. I don't know if we have time.